All right, you've just been listening there to House Speaker Paul Ryan along with the GOP leadership of the House unveiling the new Republican proposal for taxes. We've still got Ed O'Keefe standing by on Capitol Hill, but we also want to bring in Lauren Lyons Cole. She's Business Insider's Your Money Editor, and she's joining us here at the desk while uh, Ed is in Capitol Hill. Um, so, Lauren, let's start with you. Uh, what are the biggest changes? You just listened to what these guys had to say. What are the biggest changes middle class Americans are going to see with this new tax plan? So some of the biggest changes, uh, the new tax plan is collapsing. We currently have seven different tax brackets. They want to collapse it down to four. It's not going to be a massive change for most people, but it is going to simplify some, some of the tax filings that we do. Beyond that, they're eliminating the ex personal exemptions and growing the standard deductions. So single filers will now be able to deduct $12,000 and joint filers will be able to deduct $24,000. Now with that comes the elimination of many itemized deductions. So the state and local income tax deduction, um, the uh, property tax deduction will be capped. There's a lot of different deductions that are going to be swept, swept away with this change. Yeah, and that was sort of the argument that, yeah, sure, uh, you know, you may be able to keep more of your money, but what are the deductions going to look like? We didn't know what the deductions were going to look like. Um, so this presumably will be a simpler tax form because that was what the president was saying that he would be providing. But what about those deductions? Do you see anything that might hurt the middle class? So here's the thing. 70% of Americans claim the standard deduction. So for the vast majority of us, we won't actually notice a huge difference. There might even be a small tax cut, as they were uh, saying earlier there. But for the Americans who are living on the coastal sections, high earners in New York and California who are used to deducting the state and local tax deduction, some families will definitely see a slight increase with these changes. All right, Ed, let's talk about the politics here. Uh, I thought it was really intriguing that some reporter asked that question at the end, something you and I had been talking about with Anne Marie before the House leadership started to deliver or talk about this plan to the public, which is should they be in charge? Should they be have should they have the majority if this plan fails? I mean it feels as if Paul Ryan is really banking everything on this. Everything that's happened in this administration from the moment that President Trump was inaugurated until today, the speaker has brushed aside yes. and said, you know, I'm not focused on that. I'm not focused on what Senator Corker is saying or Senator Flake is saying. I'm not focused on the president's tweet. I'm not focused on the Russia collusion investigation. I'm only focused on tax reform. Yeah, because he understands that failure to do this is going to put himself at risk and his entire caucus at risk next year going into the elections. That's why you saw them emphasizing how this would you know, help working families or middle income earners because those are the voters next year in competitive congressional races across the country that are going to matter and that are going to need to be won over by either side of the aisle. Uh, look, they can express as much optimism and hope today about how well this is going to go and he can claim that they're focused on this and they're going to get it done. But we could rewind the tape to over the summer when they said that's exactly what they were going to do about health care reform and it didn't happen. So until they demonstrate that they're actually passing these bills easily, we're going to have to remain skeptical that they can get it done. You look at what Democrats are saying so far about this, Vlad, they call it a half-baked plan that was put together behind closed doors in the dark with absolutely no input from Democrats. They, for now at least, for the most part, will remain opposed to it. Uh, Nancy Pelosi did an interesting thing just before this event. She brought together California Democrats to put pressure on the 14 Republican congressmen from California to say, how could you vote for this if it's going to affect people's ability to deduct property taxes, which are high in California, or to go after working families and give all these benefits to large corporations? You're going to see pressure put on specific Republicans across the country. They're going to get squeezed to some extent. And there are a handful of races in California, for example, that could flip to Democrats next year and help them win the majority back. That kind of politicking will go on now as this tax debate continues. Lauren, just turning back to some of the highlights of this plan, the 401ks, no changes there at all. That's the kind of stuff that regular folks are interested in. What does that say to you? So the 401k debate was huge. A lot of people got very upset about the ability, taking away the ability to save for retirement on a pre-tax basis. But the reality is a lot of people aren't actually doing that. I'm very happy to see they left this in place because there are a lot of Americans who will benefit. But the most important thing from my mind, talking about the 401k, 
401k is to take a look at whether or not you are actually contributing. If you got upset about it, go check your plan. Make sure you're actually saving for retirement. And the Roth 401k was uh, discussed during that time. It's a post-tax retirement savings, which is not a bad option. So this is definitely a topic I hope we'll continue to discuss. Mm. You know, Ed, let's talk about that for a moment because uh, it, it sort of seemed to take into account what President Trump was suggesting. He tweeted about it, he talked about it, and that probably threw Paul Ryan and the others in Ways and Means, uh, ways and means for a loop because yeah. they probably had other ideas of what to do with the 401, with 401ks. So the question going forward is how dangerous is the president in getting this done? In other words, could the president derail the negotiations that are going to take place between all different factions in the party on how to get this done by suggesting something, by throwing something out there on Twitter that has everybody pulling their hair out and saying, as Senator Corker once said, leave this to the professionals. Yeah, no, it's absolutely going to cause great heartburn and, and, and headache for, for Republicans <laughs> if he engages in this way yet again. Uh, he seems to have won the 401k argument because we know that there were negotiators who were thinking about making changes to how you can deduct your 401k contributions. But again, what's to say that later today he doesn't engage and say, hey, you know what, there's actually this one little specific thing I don't like. The problem is, as, as Bob Corker very clearly explained to John Dickerson over the weekend on Face the Nation, anytime the president brings up one of these changes, or lobbying groups put pressure on one specific part of the plan, it's going to require the bean counters to go back and find a way to keep the savings at something like $4 trillion. It's going to add to the deficit or it's not going to cut enough and or generate enough revenue. And so that's part of the problem. The other part, of course, is the political problem, that the more the president engages on the specifics, the more he's going to squeeze his own party. And so I think that's part of what continues to motivate Democrats here, is they know that at some point the president's going to do or say something that could upend this or slow it down or dramatically curtail the ambitions of it. And we'll just have to wait and see what that is. Complicating it even more, of course, guys, is the fact that he said it to Asia this weekend for 12 days. Right. Right. Imagine if he's tweeting about this in the middle of the night when he's waking up in, in Beijing or Manila. And, and there's going to be this cross current across the world of the president saying one thing and congressional Republicans doing another. Could be a real problem for them. Ed, what was his plan in terms of how to play this? I mean, we saw health care, and you know, initially he was very involved in health care, and then that didn't really work out in his favor, so then he sort of scaled back. We saw that he had that sort of working lunch with lawmakers where, you know, depending on who you spoke to, he spent a lot of time bragging yep. and spent very little time actually talking about taxes. But what was the plan for the president? If in terms he had of, one at all. Yeah, in terms of how he was going to assist or facilitate or get himself involved or not involved in, in the tax plan. They basically want him to hang back and stay out of the way, show up to sort of rally the troops, and eventually in the closing days, perhaps, use the bully pulpit to build support for it. Maybe go as he has already this year to certain parts of the country where there's a moderate Democrat that could be pressured or go to some other kind of facility that might benefit from the changes just to help build support. But stay off the Twitter, they say. Yeah. The other thing that bothers some Republicans is they keep hearing him talk only about a tax cut plan. He wants this to be like the cut, 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 plan, I think is what he was proposing, or cut, cut, cut again. That's not acceptable to many Republicans who have been here in Congress for several years wanting to do the comprehensive overhaul that Republicans are proposing here. They say, look, if you're just going to cut taxes for a few more years the way George W. Bush did earlier this century, that's not enough for me. I want to see big wholesale changes. I want to know it's not adding too much to the debt. And I want to know that it's just beyond a temporary tax cut. Again, that's the fallback if things don't work out. But there are going to be many Republicans upset if that's what it becomes. That's an important distinction. It's one thing to cut. Many Republicans want an overhaul of yeah. uh, our tax system. Uh, and at the end of the day, we may end up in a situation, or the Congress may end up in a situation, uh, like they did with health care, uh, Ed, when the president sort of says, oh, I didn't realize health care was that complicated. It's right. the same thing with taxes. I would probably argue more so than our nation's health care system. Uh, Lauren, at the end of the day, we've listened to the House GOP leaders talking about this. Uh, we've been listening to them uh, doing that for a couple of weeks now, as well as the President of the United States, and it's been touting all the beautiful things that are going to happen should this pass. But the reality is, or let me ask you, who will benefit the most from this? Who will suffer the most? Mm. Many people will suggest, the Democrats who we're going to hear from in about 30 minutes, would suggest that the wealthy and corporate America is going to benefit. That's the Democrats point of view, who really, from an objective standpoint, will benefit? Who's going to suffer? 
When you start breaking down the math, it's easy to see who the winners and losers are, and I think everyone needs to do that for themselves. But what they said is that the average American family is going to save $1,182 a year. Okay, that's less than $100 a month. But when you compare that to something like reducing the estate tax or eliminating the estate tax, the death tax, the double tax, as they call it, that's millions of dollars that are passing from wealthy families, from the parents who have earned the money or, or had the money, down to their heirs, and that can make the wealth gap in America even bigger. So from an apolitical standpoint, that really is going to advantage wealthy people in America, where Americans in the middle of the country may see some benefit, but not huge benefits. Can they argue, could they argue, the Republicans, that, well, look, at the end of the day, if wealthy people and corporations are able to save more money, they will drive that income back to the into the economy. I, I, you know, if you're a wealthy person, I'm not one, so I have no idea what I would do. But <laughs> if you are a wealthy person, does that math work? The idea of d those folks who have more driving it back into the economy to hire more people to create more jobs. Listen, that's a very appealing argument, and I love that idea. I hope that is what would happen. But the reality is wage growth has been very slow, if not non-existent, for most of America. And I'm not sure that cutting these taxes and moving, shuffling the deck, as I call it, we're just moving money from one place to another, is going to impact pay rates for so many people in the U.S. And again, saving 100 bucks a month on your taxes, that's not enough to do a kitchen remodel or uh, anything like that. As somebody once suggested right, right. in Congress, Good yeah. Point. Uh, Lauren Lyons Cole, we thank you as always. Thank you very much. Ed O'Keefe, thank you as always, my friend. We appreciate it. Take care, guys.